What is your name? Where were you born? I'm Dan Wood. Dan M. Wood. Where'd you grow up? Los Angeles. I was born here. And parents were here. They, everybody was here. And so what was, what was life like growing up as a kid? Uh, we lived in the, on Pico Boulevard and lived in a, a, a cleaning shop. That was their profession. And we lived in the back. And I was still with the bottle. And they'd send me over with an empty bottle to the grocery store, which was right next door. And with money, change in it. And would I, would I, I wanted a quart of milk. Then I'd come back to the house, hand the milk to mom and lie down on my back and get, a, get the bottle. Well, this was going on for so long that mom finally on a Sunday was too tired to make up a bottle for me. So she said on the last nipple, she clipped it off the end of it and dad tried for a half an hour to tie the nipple on. And he had no luck. So I had to start doing I mean, this was what you had to do with Dad. You had to force that. And so they, they started force feeding me drinks. And that was fine. But I mean, my whole life was this way. And just uh, being practical and being, doing obnoxious things. And, yeah. Um, living through the wars, which when you went lived through the wars, which war do you remember the most? Like which one had the most impact on your life? This last one, of course. How so? But it didn't have any impact on mine because how could any of them have it? Taxes would go up or, or they did what they had to do. It's not a, it had no impact. I mean, as far as I'm concerned. Did any of your relatives or parents serve in the military? No, they, dad was working then for the train and it was a, a normal, useful thing, just like a, a mailman or something. And Mom went into a, a Rosie's River to, to do her little bit when, when he was on the train. And I didn't have it. We ate three square meals a day. I never had an em a meal without food. It just never bothered me. It was just a thing that happened. That, but I went in with the World War II. I went in with Women's Ambulance and Defense Corps of America. It was a group of women who who did ambulance service and, and could help out. This was before the war. And I joined the cavalry unit, which rode horses in Griffith Park. Um, and we learned how to carry stretchers between us on horses. And, and we patrolled. And it was a very very exciting life and I enjoyed everything about the war and I happened to become a colonel in the little organization. I had to march the people and, and the parade, uh, do parade drill the horses and, that they were on and so I had, I had quite a bit of military experience ahead of time and I went up and up and up and up with with everything else I did. Was there a lot of other women in the cavalry? Yes, we had several hundreds of women that worked in, in ambulances or whatever. 
So it was a, nobody knew about that history. Women's Ambulance Defense Corps of America, the cavalry division, and we went in parades, flags, and carrying flags for parades, and did all sorts of things like that. Were you only part of the cavalry? Because you said you kept going up in the... Well, I went up in, in what I could do. Oh, okay. I could do I could do everything as it came up, so I was a colonel in this organization. So when it came time for the WASP, I just moved in naturally, and they knew I could drill people and order and military, and it was all set up, and so I automatically was it to march people from classes to classes or the PT or all this whatever had had to happen was it and I know horses to be involved this time was it difficult to like did some men not treat you well because you're a woman or not take orders from you because you're a woman no I, we were all dealing entirely with women okay and I never never ever had that problem because I was bigger and I knew more than they did and I never had any schooling or classes or nothing ever had any kind of a, a problem with except a colonel who's the colonel who says okay we're all through with you December 10th so go home and have babies that one you know <laughs> what's the why well, this is what I did later I graduated and uh, at UCLA and got it had to go to SC they threw me out of UCLA uh, the PE teach I mean the PE chairman and she says we're not not gonna let you be a PE teacher you 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 want to only do softball I was I was playing softball at the time and the Olympics, I was throwing the javelin and the shot. And, the, and she said, all you'll do is teach the girls how to do that. And, and she expected me to teach them tea manners and that sort of thing. Well, no way. You know, they, they became as practical as, as I was. So it ended up that, that uh, I, 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 I just went... I just went from one to the other after I did what had to be done. And then when they said, we'd like to have some women form and learn how to fly, and we will teach them just like the men. The men have training. They are called, and they, they start right in. And so Jackie Cochran, this is the name you should write down, Jackie Cochran and then uh, heard about us, I mean, heard about us and said, this, I want to, I want to be doing, I want people, girls to fly, and because there are no men, they're all overseas, so she ended up uh, uh, having me, she said, we'll, we'll take you. She liked the questions, but you have to get 35 hours of flying time. See, the men don't have to do that in their program. They just cold. They hit the primary with twin engine, I mean, a twin wing. And then we have intermediate, which is the first low wing and with a stick. And then we had intermediate, I mean, uh, advanced with AT6s, which have power, 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 close, the closest thing to what the boys were flying for the big stuff. And so we had to go through training of all, all these different, different things and, and tests at the end of each one to see if you pass, because there were 40 women that made up our 
squadron, our class, 40 women, and they divide them right down the middle, 8 a, 8 a. m. and N to Z. And the first ones would be on the flight line in the morning, and the, the others would be marched to to the classes where we took radio and engine, take take apart and put together, and all, all the kinds of things we had to do with, with our classes. And then at noon time we'd have lunch together, all together, and then they would take our places and we'd go on the flight line for the afternoon. And then they they took us for the, our first ride and 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 they really trained us just just like the men cadets, except we were already advanced of thirty five hours and and they wanted us to take this and so that we could see if we got sick every time you went up, or if we were too short, we had to have piles of pillows underneath us along with our, our, our parachutes that we sat on. And when, they, when if we could pass the, the primary, then we would go on to the intermediate and and do our instrument work with a very steady low wing, which was a, a change for us, and then finally to the advanced, and the advanced is an AT-6, and that, that one had, everything had sticks, we didn't have any steering wheels for diving like they have now, they were all sticks between our knees, but the 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 AT-6 had a stick with a trigger on it, and I would go up when we were doing solo, and I'd hit my rudder pedals, I'd make the nose go this way, and I'd, <laughs> and I'm shooting them down, and I'm getting every one of them, you know. <laughs> well, it was a, it was a, we had lots of fun things and lots of experience, and why don't, you, why don't you talk a little bit about what you accomplished? I know, didn't you fly around the world when? So when I, I had my 300 hours that I got from the wasp, and, and uh, they sent us home to go have babies. And most of the girls didn't have anything to fall back onto, but I had, I had a teaching credential, so I was had been teaching prior to, so I just stepped right back into that, started making a big salary of $700 a month, and, and uh, after the, after all the, the months went by and I became three-year uh, permanent, and I said, well, I guess I'm going to be successful in this, so I want an airplane. So I bought a little put, 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 so, you know, so big, 75 horsepower thing, went 75 miles an hour, and, and played around with it as I'm teaching. And then I got a larger airplane when I decided I wanted to go around the world. This little guy, put, 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 was not strong enough to carry all the maps that I had to carry and changes of clothes in summer and winter because I, I meant to planning for a whole year flight to go around the world. So that, I mean, anyway, I did all, all of that and I'd like you to turn this off and go in and look and see my flight which is in the bedroom. I have it on a map. When you traveled to all those different countries, did it were any of the countries hostile towards you when you Well I was jailed as a spy in in uh, 
for intruding into a private aviation when I had to have had to have an like the engine went funny on me and I was you know, I was getting low on gas and they didn't want me to go in. They wanted me to go someplace else, Libya. Uh, and I I ended up being not jailed, but I was uh, held. They took my keys to the airplane. And they stuck all kinds of, of yardsticks down into my tank to try to see if I had do have enough gasoline to get someplace. Well, I didn't have enough gasoline to get someplace. And, oh, anyway, finally the, the air attache in, in sent me a telegram and says, you're now free to go. We've got this all straightened out with the government, but don't have any more forced landings. So then I went across territory and and then that next place I had to go down onto a military aircraft. I didn't I didn't I had too many headwinds. I couldn't get as far as I wanted to go, so right away that first flight I had to get to so I go to this strange needs a battery. They go to this strange uh, airport, military, and a guy with a gun came out, and he uh, he couldn't speak English. He took me after I tied down the plane. He took me over to a to a room, and went inside the room. Nothing's happening, nothing's happening. I mean, what in the hell am I going to do? Be put up for the, the firing squad? You know, I didn't know what was going to happen. So they finally, the postmaster came in, and he was the only one that spoke English. Oh, welcome, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. What can we do for you? <laughs> so they got me hotels and, and transportation into town. And, and anyway, I, was, I, was, I got the, the treatment. Next day they picked me up and I took off and went on, on my, the rest of my trip down I think it ended up with uh, in India, someplace where I had to do the next thing and the next thing. So you met the situation when it happened, and you just did it. When you've got an airplane, it's a weapon of death, and it's war. And so an airplane is not a welcome thing ever. <laughs> My little guys were so tiny. This, this guy should it had no no firepower. And it was it was it was interesting. So I did I got I called it jailed as a spy. And uh, but I was just held over and till they tried to believe me. You know. Out of all the places you visited. Which one was your favorite? Paris. Mm. I went in there and met a Frenchman who spoke beautiful English, who was a pilot during the war, and he he flew for the the, the, the foreign people. And I I almost married him because he was really just a grand, grand fellow. And I, so I had my choice. Do, do I want to just stay here and finish my trip and marry him and have an illegal child but tell my parents I got married and, and uh, 
I'm, you know, and I'm probably in a, I'm married, and they're over here, and, and then I have a child, and then I get a divorce, and, and, and then can go on. So that didn't sound like a bunch of stuff. So I, I forgot it all. I said, you know, but he went with me across part of, of uh, Madrid and, and Spain. And we got to a, a border. He said, my, uh, my visa only goes so far. Goodbye. So we had flown together a couple nights in a couple of different hotels. And he never had any hanky-panky. He, he was delightful. So of course I visited him later when I when I flew to the north and came back down again. I contacted Jean Pierre and if we went I went down to the south and I came back to Paris crossing. He said, You don't go from one place to the other without going through Paris. So I ended up seeing a lot of him and wondering what happened with him and he probably wonders what's whatever happened to me. But yes, we had a very interesting, interesting things happen. Yeah. Did you ever get lonely? Because you're by yourself flying around the world? No, I, I was too busy. And you don't get lonely when you're flying. True. I mean, you're heavenly. You're, you're, you're king and queen for the day, you know. No, it was just too beautiful. And you made, you made your way. You made it. It was fun every place. And every place was a good experience. And, and it was different. And, and if an engine needed to be worked on, I, I got the people there to do it. And in Arabia, I got some bad fuel, and I was going, <coughs> and I had six emergency landings, where snowy, icy roads, and and I'd come in and land, and and get check everything out, and it ran like the son of a gun, but it would only let me go a little ways if I tried to take off. I clear the people out of the way and and go on up, try to take off. I could get to the 500 feet, and then it would, <laughs> and I would have to go to the next place. And at one place, I they they took a, the same men in the same cars on the same highway came to me and and. Uh, I put their hands on a per certain place on the on the airplane, which was strong, but there was a, a water culvert at the end of the side of each street. And as I made my turn, my tail wheel went over and whoosh, down with the airplane. So I said, I need I need, need some men, you know. Pig Latin, and put them in strategic places. So, hut two, three, ho! Oh! And they pushed it back up again. So, it was fine. But that we had that one place, and then I, I was going along the same highway, uh, ice and snow over here, and there, there was a, a big truck. Not a truck, it was a hauling vehicle that had a, I mean, it was a big, it was as tall as, as this ceiling, and a donkey, a little donkey, was pulling it. It was a light load. And so I, they were going too slow, and I, you know, I'd been on the, all these emergencies. So I had to try to go around him, and I couldn't go around him. 
because the road wasn't wide enough for me to spin or get my tail over on this side. I didn't want to go down again. So anyway, I, it I had to go around, and that little donkey was dancing like this. It was so frightened. But it, uh, he pulled off finally, and I got to pass him. So now I still have an engine that won't work. So I got up to this main little town, and the airport that's being built is off on a diagonal off this highway. So from where I, I took off here, I couldn't get help in the town, so I had to go across this snow icy plains to get over to this airport being built. So it ended up that uh, I got up 500 feet. <laughs> snow and ice, snow and ice. And I had this that I'm <laughs> I just want <laughs> I just want to get over to here. And I got to here and there's snow and ice all over it because it's not in it's, it's in construction. It's not finished. So I had to go ahead and land and I came in <laughs> with the two radio beams that are, they have for the airliners and and I I passed just a, they're six feet high and I passed right there practically looking up at, at these posts and just kept going and going to where I could see the end end of the of the of the uh, runway and I landed and it was slow and it was you know so thick and it was fine until I tried to turn off at a, at a at what was a taxi strip and I could tell was a place where you, the planes would be would be uh, tied down and I broke a right wheel brake so I that meant that I whenever I wanted to land I had no control if it started to go right, I couldn't do anything. So I had to uh, work. But anyway, we got the thing into a space, and then a truck came by and said, and my Danish woman with me spoke French and Danish and, and German, and she could speak a lot of things. And this is Greece. They could understand each other. So she says, we need somebody that's had some kind of airplane experience for repair. Because this, the airplane won't run. So that man went back to the town and he found the man and brought him out. And he, he did some checking with the airplane and he drained this line and drained this line and drained this line and I think it'll work and so I, I, I can't really, I can only take his word for it so then I had to get out some way back onto that makeshift runway and take to take off and I take off but I don't have any right control because I don't have that brake. So the and the engine it the engine wanted to stop stop again. So I turned around, came back, and landed in the same place I the man was there, at least I had him waiting. And it took us overnight and and he ended up taking having to take the carburetor apart. Because there was some, it was the only thing that was clogged up was this carburetor, and I don't know a carburetor from a hole in the ground. I just 
was, I mean, I wouldn't even try to do anything mechanical on an airplane. Well, he took, and then to take a carburetor apart, he was going to do that. So anyway, he did it, and uh, he said it was inside to the very center was all plugged up, and so the gas couldn't get through the float complete by itself. It was had to kind of seep through in order to work. So he says, no, I got that all cleaned out. So that's fine. So then we finally took off and I went down, took off and went south to this Adana, which is, which is a military base for the Greeks and the Americans. And I, I said, I want permission to land because I'm out not going to have enough gas to get over to Libya. And they blah, 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 blah. we can't go, this is far, blah, 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 and they find they, they okayed me. I guess American was, was nearby or something. They okayed me to come in, and that's when I was jailed as a spy for entering a, you know, a prohibited place. And, yeah, it, anyway, that, they were able to Take, take off, um, or find a right break that had some had hit some mountain or uh, done something, but it the wheel was still intact, and, and so they were able to use that it, that uh, wheel break to put on the mine so that mine would work. There, but it took took a, a bunch of people to do all this, but it's enough. <laughs> Would you? So you have mechanical problems, and you have and you have air weather problems, and <laughs> but you have all the problems that you have with any place. What did you eat when you're in the air? Oh, I always had a snack. I had sausage and, and bread and I always had a had a something to snack on. And I I would have whoever was co pilot had to be the person to fix it. Fix it. If I had three people, why well, it was a cinch, these people in the back just made the sandwiches or the crackers or the Whatever, and I had paper plates. And I had a picnic in the airplane. Oh, what was the name of your plane? Little Yellow Frog. Why'd you Why'd you decide to name it that? Because it was an Indian good luck cloud name, and uh, the the Indians had taken it, and it became a, a special good. A good, a good signal. And anyway, I grabbed it when I had my airplane painted, and I had a brand new uh, uh, lines. Well, it was like a rainbow, a continuous rainbow that went across the hood and and along the side and came back together again, back on the tail here. It was just beautiful. But anyway, it was the prettiest paint job. And I, I designed it and, and had them do it that way. So, Where is your airplane now? So uh, when I came home, I flew a lot more hours. And, and then I got over, I had 52 years of an, in that airplane. So it, uh, it did me as did me good, went any place I wanted it to go. It went to tip top through Alaska and every place, Mexico. And finally I had, I got old and I stopped driving a car, but not until I stopped flying the airplane. 
because I was finding I was not making good decisions. And you have to make good decisions when you're up there or you'll still kill people. So I gave it to the St. Andrews uh, Museum, which is just north of Portland, Oregon. It's a little tiny, oldest airport. It's, it's still useful and for a hundred and it's been using for used for 105 years at that time. This is like 115 now. And I said, I want to give it to you because when we lost, were up at Portland, Oregon, this was a side trip when we went to see the Grey Goose and had dinner with them. And then we took the bus and went on a little farther across. There's just a little two two-way bridge that goes from Portland the north to St. Andrews, which is the next state, which I always mixed up with St. Andrews over here, but it had this little airport and it has been used for dirigibles and for air, air airmen and all kinds of things. They'd go up in a dirigible if the wind was just right, and it would take you across the Snake River, and you could come down and land in Portland if it, the wind was just right. It, you can't direct, because they don't have a power motor on it. So anyway, I, I said I like this place because they like to deal with the youth and they will, they will function with the youth. So I said, this is, if I ever give away my plane, this is where I'm going to have it, because it would be of use for the youth, all the maps on the sides, and, and what better place to have a place where it's in a hangar, and it's, protected so they had to have it uh, have a man come and assess it for, for what its value was so that they could do it for income taxes and I could do so it was a thirty three thousand dollars at that time they it sold originally at five hundred dollars <laughs> and so now it was a $33,000. It was very nice. I, I gave it to them. And did, you, uh, did you get to fly the plane to the museum? Did you get to fly I it? I did that, yeah. I, I planned and I got a man who was a specialist in my type of airplane. Hi, Michael. What? You said you were flying to the museum and you hired... Or you had a guy. Oh, I hired, I hired a man who was a specialist with my style of airplane, and I said, "Would you like to go with me? It'll take probably four or five days, and before you can get back, and I will pay all your expenses, and three hours of like you had a class, uh, uh, sixty-five dollar." Uh, lesson a student and anyway I I paid more than more than plenty to get it get him to ride co-pilot I made the flight plan I did the whole thing with the, the maps and, and uh, I said where we wanted to go and how we wanted to go and where we would stay the night and, and he just he just helped with the Gas with the if there was a problem with with anything around, the, but he wasn't needed. And uh, he, he he we went all the way up there except when we got to Portland. I I can't I don't have the radio facilities to go to the big airports like Portland and LAX and. And 
I can't understand the radio context, so I, okay. you have you have to get me in through the channels. But what I want to do is this, 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 and this, and this importance taking off this way, and I want to be down here at 800 feet so that I'm out of the way of all that and laying down here. Oh, he, he was enjoying it, but I, I couldn't hear anything on the radio. And, and it turns out they told him directions to come in, how he was to make his pattern. And he, and he said, uh, I understand that, that this uh, pilot gave me this plane away once it done this way. So when they... When we arrived, he did all this, and I'm supposed to come in from the south or the east or the west. And he ended up, um, his last remarks were, come into our office. And that means they're going to take your license away for disobeying and blah, 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 blah. So I, I didn't know all this, and he told me later. And... We, we, we landed and, and we got there exactly when we were supposed to get there and, and all my relatives had come down from up in the Seattle area and they were waiting for me and the red carpet was, was laid out and, and uh, the cadets, the flying cadets were all around and it was a it was a very nice welcome. And I liked it. And anyway, I said, here are the keys. So they, then they took, us, took me to the hotel and, and uh, then had a banquet for me at, at the, for the evening. Is it hard to get? $200 I paid a room for us in the hotel. It was that kind of a place, and I had to take whatever they gave me, $200 a night. I mean, way back then, 10 or 15 years ago. <laughs> so. Was it hard to give up your plane? Uh, no, it's a necessity. Yeah. So there's nothing hard about it. I miss it, yes. And I, I think about it. And and I know it's. In, I'd rather have it there than to have it sold to somebody for thirty-five thousand, who would have started tearing it apart because the the parts on an old aircraft that are good would have come closer to fifty thousand. So I didn't want it torn apart. What was it like living in the depression? The depression? Yeah, like I didn't have any problem with it. Was the folks were paying the bills. No, I didn't. No, nothing hard. No hardship on food. Mom, Dad was making a nice enough salary and, and was paying and putting me through UCLA. And, yeah. So don't have any hardships. You don't allow them to happen. You, you work around them. What, what kind of, what planes did you fly? Like what model? It says, it's, I mean, it no, says, don't you, don't you know planes? That <laughs> as a steerman was the biplane. And then the first low wing was the Fairchild uh, Voltee vib Vibrator. And then the final one was ATC, <laughs> a low wing powerhouse. And we could buy these powerhouse airplanes on the surplus for $500. Wow. And I could have had one, except they used $2,500 worth of gasoline. Uh, you know, and I couldn't afford the gasoline. <laughs> this is what it's like now with the women who want to fly, 
you can't afford the gasoline, six dollars a gallon. Yeah. And my little airplane took eight gallons an hour. Well, you can imagine a big powerhouse, 450 horsepower thing, would take 25 gallons. And 25 times six, you multiply it. That's, you know, it's impossible to. And way back then, it was it was all right. It was. We, they had put us into one of the rooms, and then uh, it was not large enough to hold all of the masses of people that had come. <coughs> so they ended up with a, with a larger room, and we filled that. And had balconies up here, and people were sitting and watching, and all of our wasps were sitting down here in and uh, I have there's pictures of them in the in the book. So how many how many other women got the NASA? That are still alive? Or that got the Medal of Honor. Oh. All of them? And all the dead ones. The parents got one of the dead ones. So did the women who passed away, did hmm? they, the women who died, did they die just from natural causes or did they die while serving? They died from old age. Okay. Yeah, and I'm still here. What was the Texas Women's University? That is the place that has, in Texas, in Dallas, that has taken over our, the collection of our uniforms and everything pertaining to the WASP. And they have a file like this of, of my articles that I have in the paper. And, and uh, oh, yes, I wanted to give you some other names there. Um, Jackie Cochran was the one that saw what Nancy Love was doing, and she was talking to Colonel, the second one is Colonel, um, I think it was the second, Haparner, H A P, Colonel Hap, H A P, Arnold. Jackie Cochran contacted Hap Arnold and says, you've got to let these women join and become a force just like the men's pilots. That, because there are no men pilots around, they're all overseas fighting wars. We need women to learn to fly so that they could do what what the men were doing. Um, so, Hap Arnold, Nancy Love first, and he says, finally, Jackie Cochrane, you're going to be in charge over all Nancy Love. She, she's a, she was a pusher, a real nasty little pusher, and she didn't care what she did, Nancy, and, and so Hap Arnold got got that in and it was um, there, there's three big names that were the beginning of our our wash program and that but uh, Jackie Cochran had such a good idea to you would just have the same program now that the men except they get have to have 35 hours of flying time to see if they like it or not, or can do it or not. And he liked that, to think, oh, well, women need 35 hours to seed themselves out. And anyway. Is this WASP program still around? And this, no. When December 10th came along, they sliced it off. You still communicate with anyone? And told the girls to go have babies. 
I'm in the same breath, you know. Do you talk to any of your friends? Oh, well, I, I, I was all set with, like I said, with, because I already was a teacher and I had money coming in. They didn't have. They, they tried. They bundled up in six in an apartment, mm. sharing the price of this and trying to get any kind of a job that they could get. You know, it'd be in the aviation field. And it was just, it just couldn't work for them. Few of them became instructors or something else, but they had to go through a lot more training of some kind to do that. Do you still communicate? Hmm? Do you still talk to anyone in the WASP program? Are you still friends with any of those people? Do we see them? Yeah. And talk to them? Yeah, yeah we get together once a year, and uh, all the bulletins come out once a once a month from the the, the main museum of which is uh, the sweet the Texas. Uh, anyway, they it everything comes through channels, and then and then they say this has been the what we've discovered with our our um, women pilots who who are now I mean they're in they're in getting all of the all of the uh, care and all of I mean they're doing but anyway they have to find out a military they get they get some military medical service now which they couldn't get when they weren't Army and Air Force, but they, they've gotten help. So a lot of the women that really have real problems should, should have had some kind of hearing help or they couldn't afford 15, 15 to $1,500 $1, to $3,000 for a hearing aid. They, they could get some help. How old were you when you joined? Mm -hmm. How old were you when you joined the WASP? Twenty-two or three, mm -hmm. and I was only in for a one-year stint, which which meant I, I well I, it was a little longer than that. It it was ex probably exactly with my thirty-five hour flying time, and then their training at uh, in December tenth. It's cut off, so it's just 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 under barely under a year, and a lot of gals. The wasp started in under Nancy Love, and they were called WAFs, W A F S. That's under Nancy Love, and they're very very important. Very few WAFs still. Women's air ferrying. So there are very few of them left. But uh, the, the first ones came directly f from Nancy and came into the program, but they had to learn how to fly the Army way. And here they've been ferrying planes all over the East Coast and they had to learn how to fly the army away so that they could do it right. Because they would, they the way the way they did it was here's here's an airplane wasp, take it. And we'd say, Where's the throttle? What are, what are your big high, um, how high RPMs do you use? Where are the brakes? And send us out and start flying it. That was your checkout. It'll go, and it'll should fly at that sort of speed, you know, 400 miles an hour, and you know, and you land, and it was a interesting, but you had a tough. You know, you didn't have any uh, yes or no and instruction on when they started flying the P-47s and the a, the, the uh, a, 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 A's and the, but they, 
They stayed away from the, the jet until later, and finally these people were put into the jet stream, and they learned how to do this, and they, they flew the B-25s and B-24s and, and big things, and in one of them, the, the, uh, the B-24 school, that was a four engine, the men said, it's not a safe airplane. It breaks in half when it crash lands. We don't want to learn to fly that, and they wouldn't fly it. So the commanding officer said to these WASP, about six of them, I want you to learn how to fly this airplane and land it. And, or they, in secret, they did. And they went, one day the colonel says, fly up. We have something happening now. And uh, VIPs come in. So all of a sudden, in came this, this airplane. And it landed. And it pulled up, right, you know, right, right where it's supposed to, with all the men here, not over here or here, but right where it was supposed to. And the men were still standing. And one by one, six women got up, started walking across towards them. You know, and they have a little different stature than, than the men do. But the six, and the colonel says, Did you men all see that? Six little tiny women are flying this airplane, and they can do that with it. Now, what is this malarkey about you not being able to? It's an unsafe airplane. Well, the women do it. So, that was a true story, too. WASP? What is that? Like, what does it stand for? Oh, women. It was Army Service Pilots because it didn't become Air Force and anything until uh, three years after they signed the armistice. Then they say, they say we've got to become Air Force. Force, Navy force, you know, become become that, <coughs> and not not Army Air Corps, mm -hmm. you know. You you think the Air Force is that everything is called Air Force, and, and it, it it wasn't. It was an Air Corps, and everybody, everybody was in Army Air Corps, or they were in the Navy Air Corps. Or we didn't have any uniforms when they first in 1942. Everybody had to buy their own, and we had a khaki pants that we decided on on a white shirt. So we. We bought those, and then when we started the training, they finally got fatigues. You know, the fatigues are the little coveralls. That they finally got the coveralls from the from the regular the men, but they were the extra large size, which had never been used. So they handed us. For the first 40 gals, they had a air force. They had to pull the pull the pants up, put a belt around so that they could walk. <laughs> and, was, and that's no lie. That's that's the first uniform that the Air Force Air Corps gave to the WASP.
I really got so homesick. We had we had long barracks. And so, and in front of us was a, a fire hydrant in front of, I mean, it was a water hose, just a water hose. And I made a garden. I was so homesick. And I just, and I'd never made a garden even when I was home. <laughs> but I made a garden. I had lettuce and radishes and, you know, that kind of stuff all growing up right out in front of Did you have to learn how to abort a plane? Abort? Like eject or jump out? Oh yeah, anything. How to get out? Yeah, oh yeah. How to crash land? How every kind, we had to go through every kind of a, a situation. You know, engine stalling, two engines stalling, and you know, and it, just turns over. So everything does something when when the power stops. Yeah. That we is. had to learn everything. We had to learn how to parachute and and, uh, and we stepped off of the auditorium stage, jumped down on mats, and uh, I could roll and kip to, with the best of them. And the instructor saw me, he said, hey, lady, uh, demonstrate what you just did. And I kipped and let my knees go too fast. And I went, whoa, and so I, I finished it out. And uh, when it was all over and they had everybody practicing, I went up to the instructor. I said, I said, I think I hurt my shoulder, so let me go to the hospital. So I thought I'd broken my shoulder. I just just ran, boom! <laughs> I was gonna be such a show off. <laughs> I became a because I kept doing more and more things better than the average girl, you know, the PE teacher. Uh, they, they ended up in the last, in the last month, I was assigned to the number one position of the, the whole group to meet with the big shots officers. When girls would stay out too late, they'd get drunk, or they'd break some rule real badly, and even though it was right near the very end, they, they had to decide whether they were going to let them continue and stay in, or, or wash them out. And uh, we had to make the decision on those. And then for graduation, they, our whole group, and everybody else, eight was here, nine was here, ten was here, and seven, six, five, four, everybody that was left had to walk in review because up on the stage here was Jackie Cochran, Hap Arnold, and, and, uh, the big, the big shots, and Jan. <laughs> so I ended up as a, as a full colonel, but we didn't, we didn't use those kinds of signals anymore. What was the scariest moment for you when flying? I was uh, assigned to the twin engine school and uh, and I'd had I was on slightest during the, my furlough, and the instructor wouldn't let me go up and fly. He said, "Your throat's not well yet. You have to wait a week." So 
a week later, everybody else has gotten all kinds of instruction. Jan, go on up to someplace north and uh, we'll pick up a, 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 a man up there that where they were having four, I mean, they're having landings on a little grassy field. And this airplane had come down because it was leaking oil so badly. And so when I arrived, I said, I'm going to pick up an, an, a, a fellow whipper that's been working on this particular airplane. So he told me when he was ready to leave, and we took off and went south. And it got darker and darker and darker, and I hadn't had one minute at night flying. And I said, where are the lights that are turning on the dashboard, you know, and out in the airplane? And so the instructor was, I mean, the, uh, uh, the mechanic was, he knew all this stuff. And so he did it, and it's getting blacker and blacker and blacker, and then black up there was, was, I mean, everything was black. Black out on the lights. There's not a light, any, not a street light, not a nothing. And uh, it ended up, it, it, it was just, and it was so black that it looked like it was just all flat. You couldn't tell there were mountains in the pier or or, or where you were, and we got over near San Francisco, and we had we had made it. I had made too much of a turn to the right, following the radio, which I hadn't been checked out in, and so we got over San Francisco. We recognized it, the bays and the ocean black over here. And we're supposed to take the airplane and set it up and head it towards the ocean and then jump out and bail out and let it go. You know, if it was getting, I mean, you're lost and it's nighttime. So we went. I said, do you want to jump? And he said, no. I said, I don't either. So we just stayed. I knew the ocean was here. And this is San Francisco. Stockton is here where I have to go. There's over some mountains over here. So we ended up just going down. Now you can't see, you can't see airports. You can't see nothing. I thought I said, recognized some marshland and it came down, lights on, everything underneath here to try to light up and gear up and ended up, I said, this looks like marshland and I didn't know there could be telephone poles in front of me and I wouldn't know it and, and ended up I said, that's marshland. So I could land in the marshland because I had an engine that was smoking and ready to catch fire. It was on the pilot side. And if we jumped, we had to walk out through that door onto the wing and then burn up someplace and don't pull your shoot too fast. And it ended up that we got down to the, I was coming like this, and and I'm below, and I said, what's this? This is a mountain up here. And it went right along parallel here, and it ended up that it was an air airport. On the airport is a tetrahedron. That's a, a little airplane made out of wood that gives the direction of which way the wind's blowing. And I said, 
Oh, that's an airport. Up here, I'm looking. Oh, that's an airport. Oh, 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 oh. And looked up above here, and it was here was a red light flashing, and it was the tower. Up, up. Here was on a real high. Red, 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 red. Don't, 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 don't land. Don't land. Don't land. Don't land. And uh, I said, well, that's why we're not supposed to land, because this says we're supposed to go that way. So I ended up saying, well, I now know which way I have to land, and that is an airport, and that's a tower. So I pulled up and almost took the tower off up here. I, I can't suppose I wanted to get, you know, get on the ground. And anyway, went around it and came on down. And I cut it too short, and I came this way to land, and there wasn't enough runway for landing. I, was, I had to start way back there, so I went up again, and I went way down that way again with this engine smoking, and came in and, and landed up there, and then pulled off at the first airplane parking space and they said you know go to here and go here to go here and then tied down and we ended up he was assigned to to the, the men men's unit and I was assigned to the nurses unit to stay the night and go have some dinner and do all this stuff and that We'd have to wait till the next morning to see what was happening. So next morning, we met outside there, and the tower, I mean the airport maintenance said, we won't allow you to take off and leave because there's too much oil all over your engine. Well, why don't they say, wash it off, I mean clean it off. And I said, what do you think, mechanic? Can we make it? Because all we had, you could see over a little low mountain here, that that next valley was Stockton, you know, 25 miles away where we wanted to go. He says, it's all right, it'll make it. So I took his word for it, well, it's his life too. And we took off. And at daytime, I could see the ocean. I could see Stockton, you know, and I just turned towards it and went directly to it. Now I, I'm approaching, and he had tightened down the oil thing again. And we took off, and it was not smoking. And halfway, it started smoking again. Because it was just leaking oil like man and, he, and then we got near with the air the tower I said uh, get the fire trucks out and where, where do you want me to land I thought they'd have me land on the grass that was out here they said take take, take that runway and the normal runway but they kept everybody else away and so we came in and landed and Boy, I greased that dumb thing in and, you know, and turned it off right away. And the two of us ran out of it real fast and left that airplane there. And the fire trucks were coming up behind. And we just got away from it in case it wanted to catch fire. And we went, finally went over to the, to the uh, office where we had to report. And it, that was that was my scariest one. Sounds like it was I, scary. I was supposed to take an airplane out that day, Saturday, to go down to Los Angeles, and you could take any plane that you wanted on the field. So it was a maneuverable. So I invited one of the boss, and, and so she, she had met there, and I said, 
It's, I mean, we've got an AT-6 waiting for us someplace here. That's cool. But would you fly it down to L.A.? And I, I, I gave her the quadrants. And, and we went down. We went down because I had duffel bags with my dirty clothes in them. And I said, I always hand it to Mom. And she washed and ironed everything, put it back into the duffel bag and I, so I could go home. But uh, when we were ready to go home, uh, I told Opal that I'll fly it back. And thank goodness, because uh, I would not have gotten in another airplane in the rest of my life. Mm. So I flew it home and, and I've been flying ever since, yeah.